By now, you probably recognize that the language used in Romeo and Juliet by Shakespeare is a bit complex. We know that Shakespeare would change the order of his words, and that is what makes it oftentimes a bit challenging for us to read or contemporary readers to access. And so what makes it even more difficult is that there is quite a bit of rhetoric in Romeo and Juliet. So you probably notice that the language is very, well, if you can appreciate it, very beautifully crafted, um, deliberately constructed. And so when you think of that, you think of rhetoric. And so today what we're going to do is we're going to study the persuasive effects um, that Shakespeare used in his work. And so rhetoric is just being persuasive in both writing and speaking. And so basically, it's the umbrella for figurative language. Instead of being very explicit, a lot of um, meaning is hidden behind a uh, figure of speech. And so you have to read his work very closely. You probably recognize that you need to uh, glance over it multiple times before it makes sense or is meaningful to you. So today what we're going to do is we're going to cover the rhetoric used in the work. And some of these terms are going to seem very familiar to you. And that's wonderful. It'll reinforce this idea and help you access the language much quicker. However, there are going to be terms that you do not recognize. And so you might notice or acknowledge in your, your reading of the text that, wow, this is something that is not quite clear to me. And now you're going to be able to pinpoint it and put your finger on it and say, okay, this is this type of rhetoric in the text and it functions in this way and so now this makes a little bit more sense. So let's go ahead and get started. Now here are three that you probably are already familiar with or in some contexts I know you probably have accessed it through poetry but one is alliteration. And so there's internal alliteration and alliteration but you'll, we'll focus on the alliteration. Then there's assonance which is, is sometimes you can take it for granted, um, but it's not gratuitous. It's, it's, so, it's so beautiful when you hear uh, the assonance in the work. I think that one to me is the most impressive. And then we have consonants. So one thing they all have in common is it's the repetition of letter sounds. Be careful not to um, confuse it with the letter. Okay, so letter sounds within two or more words of a phrase, sentence, or a longer passage, oftentimes most likely in a poem as well. Alliteration is the, repeats the beginning sounds, not letter. So um, you might have heard of P Peter um, picked a pepper, right? And it's all peas, but that's not always the case. It's not always that cut and dry. Then we have assonance, my favorite, which is the repetition or repeats the vowel sounds. And you'll see exactly what I mean in just a moment. We have um, the consonants, which repeats the consonant sounds. And you have to be careful not to get the two mixed up between alliteration and consonants because alliteration is the repetition of the sounds at the beginning of the word. And consonants will typically be towards the end or in the middle. But if you have alliteration initially, and then you see that same sound sort of embedded in words, um, subsequent words, and that would be internal alliteration. So you have to be really careful not to confuse the two. So here is an example of alliteration from Romeo and Juliet. Gosh, again, the, the language is so beautifully written. Gallop apace, you fiery footed uh, towards Phoebe's lodging. Okay, I skipped the seeds, right? But we see that in the first line, and it's in red, the alliteration is the f sound in fiery, the f sound in footed, and the f with the ph letters, but f sound in Phoebus. And then we also recognize the assonance with the E sound, okay? So it's all what you see in purple, Eeds, Steeds, Phoebus, Lodge Eens, okay? So it's not the same letter, okay? So because we have E, E, we have O, E, we have I, it's not the same letter, it's the sound, the E sound in the text um, that helps, th th when you extract that out, you hear um, the assonance in the work. And then here is an example of consonants. You'll look at what's in blue and notice um, we have the DS in the first line for hands, right? And then we also have the sound, the words, the hands, and that sound in itself and the two letters, the subsequent letters together. Um, it doesn't have to be together, but it, in this case functions as consonants. 
Um, we also have in the second line the v sound, and we see the repetition of it in subsequent words, phrases, lines, passages, poems, right? And so we have the loving, devouring. Now, if the V were at the beginning, let's say they said um, Venus loved, then that might be like internal alliteration, that V. But in this case, it's all in and of itself. There's no V at the beginning to start us off or to set it up. So this would be consonants. Um, here is an example of um, assonance once again. And so when you look at beauties, you could say in sign or in scene, okay? But and scene would go best with the i sound for the assonance, which is i is an is, cri i is an crimson, i an in, thy li lips and i, and thy cheeks. So it's the i sound. So um, this is very deliberate. Again, it's not gratuitous. It's not something that is just sort of random. It's very deliberate in the work. And you probably notice, oh my gosh, this is part of the reason why it's part of the literary canon. Shakespeare is not going away because it, it, it infuses so much rhetoric in the work. And, and so the language is so beautiful. And so, like I said, you probably recognize the aesthetics of the work. And so one thing that you're already familiar with is the allusion. And we know that it's a reference to um, a, a fairly well-known event, place, or person. The reference may appear in the form of a simile, a metaphor, analogy, or it may not be within any rhetorical devices at all. So let's take a look, and I want to make sure that you can see that. So I want you to get the entire term there. Okay, I think that should be enough time. All right, so let's take a look at some allusions that's used in the text. We see, um, we have Lo uh, Lord Montague says, but all so soon as all the cheering sun should in the farthest east begin to draw the, sh uh, the shady curtains for Aurora's bed. So a lot of times when you see the words that you're not familiar with, you probably should look it up um, because of course we're not as we don't. We haven't read all the books of the Bible. Um, we may, as a reader, you may not have had access to all the um, the Greek mythology. So it might be a challenge to sort of understand the allusions. So the writers, Shakespeare in this case, is anticipating that we are well read or well versed. So if you don't recognize something, simply look it up. And in this case, Aurora is the Roman goddess of the dawn. Then we're pretty much familiar with Cupid, right? We all have no Cupid, hoodwinked with scarf, um, being a tartar, painted bow of half. So it's given you all these terms. Last Cupid's the Roman god of love, right? And, um, and Tartar refers to the nomadic or wanderer Mongols that ruled uh, much of Asia um, during the Middle Ages. All right, so let's take a look at the next one. Okay. And there's Cupid, right? And then there would be Tartar. Okay, so examples of illusion, again, um, you may have gone through the reading and, and missed it, but this is in, this should be in Act 1, but examples of it would be, um, Mercutio says, speak up to my gossip Venus, one fair word, our nickname per pure blind son, um, and there in an Adam Cupid, right, and uh, King Copesha. So we have Venus, which is the Roman goddess, then we have Cupid, which is um, what we know frequently portrayed as blind is sometimes called Adam Cupid and um, her child. And then Kib Kopesha is a reference to a king who fell in love with a beggar and declared that he would marry her or else commit suicide. Obviously, the stories are much longer. The myth myths are much longer and extended. This is just an abbreviated version for you. Um, but otherwise, if this is something that interests you, like you want to read more about Cupid or you want to bring more about Venus, then you can do that. You could um, look it up and there's quite a bit of information on them. So um, some interesting ones. These are probably the easiest of the rhetorical devices. And this is the one thing that most students often get the hang of quite quickly, which is called anaphora and epistrophe. And this is the repetition of important words or words in consecutive sentences, clauses, or phrases. And sometimes you wonder, like, how do you define what is important? Well, Shakespeare will do it for you when he's using these rhetorical devices because he will repeat them. And that's how you know that they're significant. And so an anaphora repeats the first word or phrase in successive sentences, meaning sentences that follow each other 
other. An epistrophe is repeating words or phrases at the end of successive sentences. So let's take a look to see what this looks like. Here's an example of epistrophe. When I think of epistrophe, I think of the E for end, right? So that's how I distinguish between anaphora and epiphory, epistrophe is that the epistrophe is at the end. So here we have um, two examples from Romeo and Juliet. And we see that um, in this case, Benvolio says, be ruled by me, forget to think of her, right? And then Romeo says, oh, teach me how I should forget to think. Again, those are considered significant and important because uh, Shakespeare uses the epistrophe in this to sort of signify um, it. And the phrase, right, if we go back to the definition, the phrase suggests that it is important, the fact that it's towards the end, it's not the beginning, it's towards the end, which makes it an epistrophe, okay? So hopefully that makes sense to you. And so here would be then a conversation between Benvolio and Romeo, all right? And then we have Mercutio. Now this one is is uh, anaphora and it says art thou is what signifies the, the importance here and it's at the very beginning necessarily not necessarily at the beginning of the line right but beginning of like ideas or sentences or phrases so in this case that the first one is art thou and then we see art thou again and then art thou and then thou art and by art i mean it's transposed but it's pretty much the same thing and there is another rhetorical term and it can't come to mind right now the one where you refer to art thou as if there's someone there that's not quite present but in this case, it functions as the anaphora in the sentence. Catacresis, right? An exaggerated, powerful metaphoric phrase that combines highly unlikely ideas or objects in ways that could never literally be true. So here is Marcuccio who says, come, we burn daylight, ho, oh, right? And we burn daylight is a catacresis. There's no way, right? He really just means that we're wasting the time. We're wasting the day away, right? But you can't literally burn daylight. It's not um, possible, but it is, um, it's exaggerated, right? These are two unlikely ideas or objects in ways that could never literally be true. You can't literally go in and burn the daylight. And so here is what it might look like. Now, antithesis is um, the use of contrast in language to bring out contrast in thought, usually expressed in opposite. So for example, here Juliet says, if he be married, my grave right, is like to be my wedding bed. You probably notice the simile there with the um, like, right, um, but it also functions as an antithesis. So we see my grave is really referred to as my wedding, be my wedding bed. Um, so those are two contrast language, and they're completely opposites, right? So bring out the contrast in thought usually expressed in opposites, and so here it is. And this is something that Juliet says and sort of foreshadows what's to come. Um, and we all know at the end that the characters, um, at least the two love-struck um, individuals, perish or die in the end. And chismos is a form of parallel structure in which the original word is switched for multiple parts of a sentence or for multiple sentences in a paragraph. So you'll see um, that, and it's kind of color coded for the first part of the sentence and the second half. And so this love feel, I that feel no love in this. So he's using the exact same words, but it's transposed and switched for multiple parts of the sentence. And that's pr pretty much what that looks like. So that one's a little bit more difficult to detect, but you might say, well, wait a minute. He just said the same words, but in a different way, right? And so it didn't really say, it doesn't really say anything in terms of the definition here about how it affects the meaning, but the, using the same, same words. And so sometimes this might explain why it might seem like, didn't he already say that? Well, perhaps because he did. Shakespeare I'm referring to. Okay, climax, not in the sense that we're accustomed to for like a plot diagram, but climax in terms of rhetorical devices would be a parallel series of words, phrases, or clauses arranged so that they proceed from the least to the most important. So basically, the, the, the character, in this case Romeo, is listing things in order. And at the top is the climax, which is the, the highest point. Right? So is love a tender thing? It is too rough, too rude, and too boisterous. And so if you look at this image here, right, it says rough, and then the next level is rude, and the next level is boisterous. So it's a parallel series of words, in this case, arranged so that they proceed from least, so rough would be the least, to the most important, at least in, in terms of 
his interpretation of love and how it applies to Romeo would be boisterous, would be the most important, and that's why it's at the highest point. Again, this is not necessarily the same climax that you're accustomed to when it comes to like a plot diagram. It deals with the rhetoric in a piece of work and explains why it's so impressive or why it's so persuasive or why it, this um, is part of the literary canon and, 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 and remains for years and years after. Great. So epithet is just an adjective or um, an adjective phrase that identifies a particular significant trait of the noun being modified. So we all refer to and still to this day write star crossed lovers take their life and we know that they're referring to Romeo and Juliet. So we have an adjective, I'll go by through it slowly, phrases that identifies a particular trait, right, and significant trait of the noun being modified. So we have star crossed and then the noun will be the lovers. And here they are. Hypophora is a, a direct contrast from like a rhetorical question. Basically, it just means the technique of asking a question and then proceeding to answer it. Have you ever um, had a conversation with someone and they're 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 asking all they're posing these questions and it's not rhetorical, right? They're not expecting you to answer, but they're answering for you. That would be a rhetorical device in which is. Uh, distinguished as hypophora, right? Hypophora, gosh. Um, and so Romeo says, is she a Capulet? And then Romeo goes on to answer the question, oh dear Count, um, my life is my foe's debt, right? So she's, he, he's answering the question that he indeed posed himself. And so that is a rhetorical device. It's interesting. It'd be interesting if we could all sort of you, you probably do this yourself, and you probably want to think of a time where you actually use this rhetorical device as well. So here is another example of Hypophora, which is, Oh, Romeo, Romeo, where art thou, Romeo? So she's asking, where are they? Right? Deny thy father and refuse thy name, or if thou wilt be uh, but sworn my love, and I no longer be a Capulet. Here's a metaphor, an extended metaphor, and so you're probably wondering what the difference is. So a metaphor is a comparison that equates two dissimilar objects or concepts, but an extended metaphor continues the comparison for a few more sentences or even pages or lines, right? So let's take a look at um, what that looks like. You probably, so I hope that makes sense. The extended is just this, exactly how it sounds. They extend the metaphor. They continue discussing the metaphor beyond the initial um, discussion of it, right? So let's take a look at an example of an extended metaphor. So Romeo, love is, and he's saying what love is, so right, it's not using like or as, it's not a simile, it's a metaphor. Love is, and he's making the comparison, a smoked race with a fume of sighs. Now in the next line, he goes on to extend that metaphor, being purged of fire sparkling in lover's eyes. And you probably hear the assonance in there, isn't there? Beautiful sighs and eyes, oh, right? And then being vexed, a sea nourished with lover's tears, what else? Um, what is it else a madness most discreet, a choking gall and, and preserving uh, sweet? There again, the assonance, so beautiful. That's probably why you just, you relish. It's like, a, 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 well, anyways, I won't go there, but I hope that you see the extended metaphor. It's, it goes beyond that first line because love is so many things to Romeo. And so he extends that comparison, which makes it um, an extended metaphor. And so then an oxymoron, um, Romeo, still, it's, so here's the definition, the paradox of self-contradictory statement reduced to two words, usually a noun and an adjective. So we say still walking, right? You know, how can you be walking and you be asleep? It's not possible. So it, it contradicts itself by making that statement. So still walking, that is not what it is. This love I feel that feel no love is this, right? You probably remember the, the line from line two, how they mix the order to, they transpose the words. Okay, so there's oxymoron in the first line. Okay, so parenthesis, right? This is where we add information or new material into a sentence to provide um, additional, often tangible information, disrupting the natural flow of the sentence. So if you see, and it, in this case, it's separated by dashes. I don't know that it's always separated by dashes, but to since the earthquake now 11 years and she was weaned of all the days of the year upon that day. And then in the middle, right, 
disrupting the natural flow of the sentence is, I never shall forget. So parenthesis really um, sort of just in the middle, right? And I think of it like as you could literally put a parenthesis around it and read the entire sentence without the parenthesis and it would work. So that could be um, your way to recall that information. And then we all know personification, right? And this is a great example of personification. Um, sometimes it could be boring, but in this case, it's just like, I hope that you noticed it, right? The given of human attributes, we all know the definition to something, an animal, or an inanimate object, or an abstract concept that's not human. But here, Lower Capulet says, the earth had swallowed all my hopes, but she, and she's just saying like, you know, all my other kids died, but she's all I have, she's all I have left. And so that is significant, um, why she's so important, and pretty much the whole story revolves around Juliet. And then we have pun, and this is really just a play on words, but a humorous ambiguity that relies on two or more words, similar uh, meanings or pronunciation. So give me a torch, I am not for the sampling, being but heavy, right, heavy hearted, heavy as in weight, and I will bear the light. Like, I can bear the light, I could see it, right? And I will also bear um, the light of it, the, the weight of it. So that's a pun. And then sarcasm. Um, this one's pretty funny. And you can't see it, but usually intended as a rebuke or retort. The power um, derives from unexpected emphasis on reward use. So Capulet, she really is insulting her husband here, right? She says, what noise is this? Give me... Um, actually he's Capulet says this what noise is this give me my long sword ho and then Lady Capulet says a crutch a crutch why call you for a sword like you're an old guy you need crutches <laughs> you know that's all you're gonna use so um, she's being a bit sarcastic and we use sarcasm all the time and we get it when you know when we hear it it's easy to recognize um, it's obviously a bit more of a challenge when you you have to read it and hear it because if you're not saying it out loud to yourself in the same context that is being used in the in the text then you might miss it and we are all familiar again with this rhetorical device which falls under the um, figure rhetorical device umbrella for figurative language as a simile a comparison between unlike things used using the word like or as and so mercutio says come we burn daylight ho which we talked about already and romeo says i mean sir in delay we waste our lights in vain like lamps by day right and so it's just poor use of time right so i guess i could be in class and tell you guys we waste our lights in vain like lamps by day and then oh my gosh you guys must say oh my gosh we're wasting time let's get right back on it so um in this case shakespeare is far more compelling than i could be when i say could you guys get back to work right um so so could you guys get back to work so i need to do that <laughs> i got through this So I hope that was helpful. We talked about the rhetorical devices used in Shakespeare's Romeo and Juliet. And that explains why the language is so absolutely beautiful and so compelling and so persuasive. It moves us, right? It moves us um, when we read it. it. It's going to remain as part of the literary canon. And so do I expect you to um, remember all these rhetorical devices? Not necessarily, but what I do expect you to do is, is go, wait a minute, let me slow down with this reading and say, this, I'm onto something here. This has, this has, this has an impact. This is here for a reason. It's not gratuitous. It's, it's here. It stands out. Um, I know, I recognize it's something far complex and I might not get it right away. So it's, I need to go back and, and be very d slow as I read this, read it closely and then go back to my notes and say, okay, this is a hypophora. This is an oxymoron. So you can identify it and, and discover the function and then how it adds to the meaning of the text.